Hello. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk about multimodal big image data sharing and exploration. So here is some multimodal image data. On the left, a 2D EM overview image at 10 nanometer voxel size and of partly the same region, a 2D fluorescence image at 100 nanometer pixel size and then a 3D tomogram of this small region here at five nanometer voxel size. Now, one technical challenge you have which with such data is that the voxel sizes are different and here even the dimensions are different. That means you cannot conveniently overlay them in the voxel space. So you need a little bit more sophisticated uh, viewer here. So in the next slide, and please forgive me my hand drawing, I try to explain how this is typically done. So you start with the data spaces here on the left. This is how your data sits more or less on your hard disk. For example, here you have a 2D array for your 2D image and a 3D array for your 3D image. And in some sense here, the pixels all have the same size if they have the same data type. Now, the next thing you do is you specify a transformation, the data to global transformation for each of these um, data sets. That's why I have the little I into the global space, which then typically would be your physical space in, for example, microvita units. And here you can now see how, for example, for the 2D image, you have also an anisotropic stretching of the voxels, which might be what happens in your microscope. And you can place the 3D volume with smaller voxel sizes, even with rotation into the 2D image. Typically, such a transformation is specified by an affine transformation, which gives you enough freedom to express what happened at your microscope. Now, to render a specific plane of this um, 3D physical space on your computer, you have to do another step. So on your computer, you have a new space, another pixel array, which is basically the pixels on your monitor. So then you do the following. So for so each pixel on your computer screen, you have to know what's the transformation of these coordinates into the global space. So I'm I tried here to depict the current fewer plane, how it might lie in your global space. And this is specified by this global to fewer transform. So you have to go backward. Then you know where you're in the global space. And then for each data source from the global space, you go backwards through the data to global transform, find out where am I, and then you know which grayscale value here you have to render. So this is how I think this is typically done. Um, then you need another ingredient if you have very big image data. Uh, actually, two more ingredients. One is multi-resolution and the other is chunking. So the multi-resolution concept is that you have your data space several times as a function of the resolution level. So typically, you downsample always again by a factor of two. So you have it high resolution, two times lower, four times lower, eight times lower. So the advantage of this now is is if you are in a zoomed out view of your data set, you can load everything from the low resolution version very fast because there's not very many voxels, which I try to indicate here by the slightly bigger fine uh, voxels. So this is efficient. Now, if you zoom in, actually two things happen. First of all, you switch now to a higher resolution version of your data. So here in the data space, you would now access a different array on your hard disk, which I indicated here with these finer voxel spaces. And a second important thing is, and this is where the chunking comes into place, you don't want to load everything, right? You only want to load the zoomed in region that you're looking at. And this is computationally only efficiently possible if your data is chunked properly. So, and here the chunks I try to indicate with these bold little blocks. This is how the data is basically sitting, for example, on your hard disk in a way that I can efficiently say, I only want to load these chunks and not the others. So for example, if you have your data saved in TIFF 
file format, this is typically not possible because then the whole plane would be laid out in disk in a way that you cannot computationally efficiently only load such a subset. So you need other file formats for this chunking. All right. So to do big multimodal image data rendering, you need these two things, I would say. So you need this concept of transformation from your data space to a global space, and you need multi-resolution and chunking. And now you need an ecosystem where you have a file format and a viewer that support all of those and that play well along together. And one very accessible example of this would be the big data viewer ecosystem in Fiji, where the file format would be HDF5 for just the data. So this can support multi-resolution and actually also 3D chunking. And then an additional XML file, which contains the transforms. And then Big Data Viewer can read uh, these two files and do the right thing. And then you can now see how one can beautifully render the data that I showed a couple of slides before on top of each other in the correct physical space. Um, if you now, as we wanted several <laughs> years ago, share such data, very big data, terabyte size data with the world, for example, have the ambition that someone on Fiji could use Fiji to view this data without needing to download everything, which is in principle possible because of the multi-resolution and chunking, right? Whenever you look at something, it can only load a very small fraction of your data. So no need to download all the whole terabytes. So it's the same concept as with Google Maps. So we wanted to enable this. But um, our IT department did not allow us to open up our file system with these HDF5 files to the public due to security reasons. They, however, told us, look, if you put your data on an object store, which is an alternative to a file system, which is uh, actually safer, then we can open this up and you can do this. Now, the problem for us was we tried this with the HDF5 file format and that didn't play very well with the object storage. So we had to look for alternative file formats that are actually made to play well with object storage. And there are now a couple of them these days. So we started actually here with the N5 file format from Janilia. There's also NeuroGlancer pre-computed and by now, maybe the most popular is OME -ZAR. So I think all of those have in common the idea that I depicted here, which is essentially that one chunk is one file is one object. So for example, here, this chunk of five by five voxels would sit in this binary blob um, in this folder. And that is convenient for an object store because the object store can just say, okay, I give you this blob of data uh, sitting here. Um, and this is actually a real example how it would look like in an OME ZAR, five dimensional. So we have here for the different dimensions subfolders. Um, and then actually here an additional folder called S0 in this case, and this is the resolution level. As I mentioned, we save the data several times in a different resolution level. So S0 is, I think, here the highest resolution level. So you have a lot of little files equals objects equal chunks, and they can be streamed from the object store uh, to the public. All right, so now combining all of this, uh, we did this in this Mobi Fiji plugin, which can be easily uh, enabled by just checking the update site Mobi. So it's based, as mentioned, on Big Data Viewer and ImageLib2. And in addition, we support loading from a number of file formats, including the Big Data Viewer HDF5 for local and the OME ZAR for the cloud. And we have also uh, several other features, which I will talk about in the next slides. So Mobi data, the concept is we have projects. So in each project is a folder structure with um, images and we also support tables. 
and we have here this dataset.json file where actually it's all the paths to the images are stored and also the transformations and things like display set the settings should the image be painted green and what are the contrast limits and stuff like that so we support um doing everything local from the file system we also support fetching everything from an object store and then we support here some mixed mode which we actually most commonly use where all the images so all the big data comes from the object store but then the tables and the metadata we actually host on github and this is very convenient because on github you can collaboratively work on this project and change things even with versioning so it's not possible to put also the images on github because github is not a place to put terabyte sized binary data but the small text data is actually conveniently managed by github so now if you have the mobi plugin and you have such a github hosted project for example here this was the first one we did the so called so called platy browser which is um, hosting the data from the publication down here you only need to enter this github location and then you press okay and then it will for you stream data from the cloud and in this case it's 231 different images em lm and also segmentation data uh, adding up to a bit more than two terabyte so i wonder how well this will work from australia to be honest since this is where your listeners are sitting right now because it's very far away from Emble heidelberg so please try it and maybe you can send me a mail how it works from san francisco for example this was very slow for me but um, yeah depends on what kind of cables <laughs> go from europe where this data sits to the different places in the world so i'm very curious to learn how that would work for you so if you do this then the mobi user interface will pop up which basically selects you uh, allows you to select which images you want to view um, you can arrange them here in different uh, groups so for example all the em data together all the segmentation data together and then what we also support is so-called bookmarked views which um, can be quite complex basically saying hey I want to load this image in this color put it here and so on and what's very nice about this we put all the figures of the application here in Mobi so that people can view them live so you get the same view as in the publication but then you can actually move around from there which we think is a really cool concept so for example clicking on the view that was just highlighted you get all of these things popping up so the viewer zooms in here to a specific region of the EM data set that um, was interesting for this figure. And here you see actually the cell segmentation, which we did with some deep learning model. And, um, and uh, this different cell segments have different colors. So this is a feature of uh, Mobi. And we can also render all the selected segments in the image j 3d viewer so you can also see how they look in 3d so one cell apparently is very long then um, another view we have is a so-called scatter plot view so from the table actually here which for each row is one of these segments and you can have different measurements put morphological features or whatever you can make a scatter plot and then see where they lie so this is actually really useful if you want to learn for example about the morphology of the cells in your sample um, to have this way of, of visualization and it's all linked so if you click in the table it would zoom in the different viewers uh, on this particular cell and vice versa um, other than that something i actually worked on in the last weeks uh, to add some more features is another thing you can do very well in this framework is registration um so some of you might know big warp actually if you right click here in mobi you can launch big warp from mobi which is convenient because uh, you can then select which sources which image sources you want to work on and there's now some other registration modes here some automatic one where we do sift features and also the turbo rack um algorithm from image is supported 
then there's always in Big Data Viewer the manual transformation mode where you can select one image and then move it around freely. Then we have here something where you can just enter an affine transformation that you might know from some other software to apply it. Uh, and here, something where you can just flip the data around one axis, which is something we just needed. So, and the very nice thing here that is this is fully interactive and works with big image data. And the trick is that the only thing that all of these registration modules touch is this data to global transformation, which is typically for us just an affine transformation. So it's just 12 numbers and they this is getting modified and nothing else. And that means even if you have a terabyte EM volume, all of this is instant. Yeah, You can just move it around wherever you want because you never touch the data space. You touch just touch these 12 numbers that map from the data space into the global space. So um, yeah, very convenient, I think, here to, for interactive registration. And actually, the example I show here is also quite beautiful, I think. So this is uh, actually in Magenta. Here is an X-ray volume image of a sample. Um, and then we got this sample and cut parts of it and imaged it in slice-based EM. And then we used all this functionality to register then back the EM into the X-ray and you see how it really beautifully overlaps now. It's a little bit of work because actually the EM seems like it introduces a bunch of deformations. So we used the X-ray here. We think the X-ray is the ground truth and we registered the EM into the X-ray, but happy to discuss more about this. All right. Um, brings me to my final slide. So there's a lot more to say about all of this. So I put here some links and I will share this with the organizer so you could explore more on your own. So the first is a publication called OMEZAR, a cloud optimized bioimaging file format with international community support. And I highly recommend reading this. And it's really amazing, I have to say. I think this OMEZAR uh, effort could really be a game changer because I think we all suffer from all these different image file formats. And uh, OMEZAR seems to be now something that people can agree on. So there's now various tools uh, among Mobi one of them, but really many others uh, that support this. So yeah, highly recommend reading this publication. Then if you want to create OMEZAR files yourself, I would recommend going on this GitHub repo. There is a tool called Batch Convert, um, which allows you to create OMEZARs conveniently from everything that bioformats can read. So basically anything sensible. Then. If you want to learn more about Mobi, you could read the Mobi publication or you explore the GitHub organization where we have all the code and also many projects. So you can open all these projects in Fiji, look at them and also maybe look at how a Mobi project internally looks like with all these data set JSON files. If you want to create yourself a Mobi project, please go to the Mobi Utils Python. It's a Python library uh, that allows you to create actually OMEZAR images and then also all the metadata that you would need for a Mobi project. Then if you want to see more videos about how all of this works as sort of live demo, you can go to this YouTube channel. And then I think actually just last week was a new release from the Saalfeld lab in Janilia of the N5 viewer. So they have now also much better OMEZAR support. And uh, I think it's definitely worth checking out what they can offer there. It's a Fiji. You don't even have to install it. It just comes with Fiji. So also might be very interesting. Okay. So then I would like to acknowledge many people. Um, so maybe just highlight Konstantin and Martin were maybe the main uh, persons um, helping with the, and Kimberly and Ekaterina with the Mobi development and in Yannick's lab and Martin, they really uh, use Mobi a lot. So they, I think for most projects, they create now a Mobi project to share the data with the users. Then also here on the right people that do not work at EMBL, here is some representatives from the ImageLib2 Big Data Viewer community, Tobias Peach, Stefan Saalfeld, Nicolas Chiarotini and John Bogovic, who is actually the author of Big Warp. Then Josh Moore, 
um, drives the whole OMSR development. So that's great. And then Norman, uh, he is actually the, I think, owner, I'm not sure, of WebNosos. Maybe you know it, but he is very much into helping with the open source development. And I would like to thank also the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which fund me and also several things around ImageLink2, Big Data Viewer, and also OMSR. Yeah, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.